Oh, it is indisputably. Okay, so we're recording now. Two o'clock. Let me check out the attendee side to see if we have any uh, lectures there. And so welcome those who just joined us. I see Sarah, Suresh, John, and Larry joined us earlier. We'll wait another minute or two to see if Director Malik can join us. I haven't heard otherwise. And if not, we will just go ahead and meet with two directors. Suresh, do you know if Dave will be here for this meeting? Uh, no, he didn't say anything to me whether he was going to be in attendance. Oh, he, he, just, he just joined in. <laughs> okay. Joined. Hello, Dave. It must be cold where you are. Oh, you're, we're not hearing you. I am freezing. Oh. I think it's the, uh, just sat down on cold pleather of my office chair. <laughs> that You'll heat it up. <laughs> no doubt. All right. Uh, we do have our alternate director as an attendee. So. I'll go ahead and move him over. Thank you. <clears throat> Alvin Edwards. Yeah. Might be a Alvin minute. For <sighs> there you go. Oh, Alvin is in the process of joining us. All right, I'm here. Thank you, Alvin. Oh, We're going to no call, call on you to be our alternate director for this meeting. Uh, that's why I listen in, just in case. And, and Joel um, Thomas is the other attendee, so he could get elevated as well, even though Larry's gonna cover uh, the, the road topic. Nice. Tom is with us now, right? Okay, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. This is the meeting of the Administrative Committee of the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District. It's January 19th, 2022, and present are uh, Director Anderson, Alternate Director Edwards, and um, the meeting, we can begin. We, is it necessary to, uh, it's not necessary to do the roll call, is it? Uh, you've identified everyone there. There's no okay. need to actually have Joel call the roll. Good. Okay, let's do it that way. Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Yes, under uh, discussion, other items. Um, the title that's listed there is um, listed as review the draft agendas for January 21 and the 27th. Um, I would just like to um, make note that um, the January 21 um, special meeting agenda was not included uh, for the packet. Um, but I can share the uh, agenda if need be. Uh, I'm sure we, we will want to look at it um, during this meeting. I believe, yeah, Sarah yeah. sent it out earlier today. Okay, well, I haven't had a chance to see what was sent out today, but um, it, it's probably the same materials I reviewed earlier in back and forth with Dave Stolt. And Joel. Okay. So, with that understanding, we can let's proceed. Um, can we see if there are any members of the public that wish to address this committee? On uh, we do not have any members of the public. Good. Okay. Not good, but we can go uh, ahead. So, action items. Who is going to tell us about the action item? Yeah, so we can just work our way through them. Uh, the first is the, the minutes. We just need a motion to adopt the minutes uh, or suggest changes if we spot anything. Yeah, I did not, I don't have any corrections. Nor do I, I'll move to adopt. I'll second. Okay. Let's have a roll call vote, please. 
Committee Member Edwards. Uh, approval. Committee Member Anderson. Yes. Chair Paul. Yes. The motion passes on a vote of three to zero. Great. The next item, item two under action, uh, Larry Hampson will introduce this one and uh, be available for questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, as you'll see, uh, there's, or as you have probably seen, there are two items concerning maintenance of the road access into Sleepy Hollow, items two and three. This item is a forward-looking item for maintenance of the road should <laughs> Uh, there be a debris fall or damage as a result of uh, winter storms or any other types of damage that could occur. Um, we don't know, we can't forecast that. We just know that the road uh, often needs some attention, uh, especially during the winter. So this is for, uh, it would be up to $10,000 or $9,950. And it would involve hiring um, valley grading and paving to be on call, uh, they would have a um, obviously a move-in fee and then whatever time and, and materials it, it costs to do repairs as part of their work. Um, this is to uh, be in effect through the rest of the fiscal year through uh, June 30th. Um, staff did ask several local contractors for quotes, um, including contractors that have worked for the district in the past. The only one that was received was from Valley Grading and Paving. And there is an attachment to this item that shows their, uh, their costs, which are in, kind of in line with uh, industry standards at this point. Um, so I guess uh, th that's the short and sweet part of it. Uh, if you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Larry. Are there any questions? Yes, Director Anderson. Yes, um, I do have some questions and um, about this and the the next item, which are which are related. Uh, first, I want to make clear that I understood your notes that Calam, it's Calam's road. They generally maintain it. That they that they have a contract with somebody some other company that doesn't always get there within the amount of time you need it. And that's the main reason that you're considering having an, an additional contract for maintenance, short term maintenance. Well, there's, right? yeah, that, that's one reason. The, uh, the other reason is that um, MPWMD does share the responsibility for road maintenance. Um, it's in the 1994 lease agreement with Calam, it, it wasn't defined. Um, in other words, it didn't say 60-40, 50-50. It just said that both uh, entities are responsible for maintaining access through to the Sleepy Hollow facility. Now, Calam is responsible for, 100% responsible for anything beyond the access to the Sleepy Hollow facility. So that, that the road to the facility actually goes up to the former San Clemente Dam and Reservoir site. Oh. Um, but the, the, the part that the district is responsible with Cal-Am is just between the Carmel Valley Road gate and the Sleepy Hollow facility. So really two reasons for this. Uh, Cal-Am has gone out in the past and done some removal of material after debris slides. But um, as you noted, uh, we can't count on Cal-Am to get out there within the time frame that the district uh, would normally need to access the facility. In fact, uh, you know, the, the contractor said, well, he could make it out within three days. And, and sometimes that's not even good enough, but that's the best we can get right now. And when I asked the Cal-Am representative, he, in the past, he's sometimes indicated a week and sometimes he said it's, it'll be three weeks. So uh, it's, it's a hit or miss um, with depending on Cal-Am to clear the road. And it's also, uh, I think the way the access agreement is written, it's a cal -Am's determination. So we can say, hey, man, the, the road needs maintenance. And if cal -Am comes along and says, well, we don't think it needs maintenance right now, it's a, their determination. Um, so it's just kind of poorly written that way. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, usually they're, they're, 
responsive enough, or at least they'll agree like, yeah, yeah, you're right. We need to do something. And then it just comes down to when, and it's usually slow. Is, but is it, is it up to CalM or is it up to the, the contract that they have with the different, um, or is it? Well, they have, they have a similar type of contract. They have a contractor who's on call yeah. for this, for, for the road. Mm -hmm. if, if there's something larger than just, for instance, a backhoe needed to clear the road, CalAM will, uh, contract, they've contracted with other folks like Granite Construction for that type of work in the past. But this is a, a guy that they use who, who actually uh, clears fire roads and he's often out in the Central Valley. And so that's part of the reason why he doesn't um, always respond in a timely fashion. The, the, the contractors that we, the district has used in the past for this road maintenance, um, typically how soon were they able to respond to requests to come in and do repairs? Uh, well, that's been on a, not an emergency type of basis. That's been on more of a scheduled basis. Um, typically, when the contractors do schedule things, they come through on time. But mm -hmm. it, in this case, it's not a uh, it's not a scheduled event. It's an unscheduled event. It's just like pick up the phone and hope that you get uh, service as soon as possible. Yeah. Well, could I ask that then, because you found one that is closer and it's available, why can't we split this with them since we're supposed to share duties? Well, uh, you know, I. It, it's one of these things that it, it could be a call where we say uh, there's some road maintenance that needs to be done in the future, and maybe it's not critical for passage. Maybe you can take a four-wheel drive and wait for CalAM to um, come out, but this is, um, this is focused on if we need it now, we've got somebody who can do it. Mm -hmm. if, there's, if there's something that happens to the road that's you know, a lot more extensive than than what nine thousand dollars can do. And and realistically, this is only like three or four days worth of work for a, a, a contractor. So yeah. if there's a if there's a large item that needs addressing, that's going to be done um, similar to the way the next item is done, where there's an agreement uh, on a cost split and who's going to take the lead. Um, so this is really it, it's. It's sort of an emergency standby uh, for not your normal type of uh, road maintenance. I understand that from what it's saying, but I, I guess my, what's sticking in my craw is that um, we were asked, I guess Caroline was asked, and then we took it over by the state to take care of the fish, take care of the river. That's why we have Sleepy Hollow. And it seems that, um, that having access to that, if you've got fish in the back of the truck, is actually very important. And I would think that replacing their contract with whoever it is that doesn't always have time to come out with this guy would, would be a good thing to do and to split the cost of it. It's just kind of a principle of the thing. Hear me. Hello. Yes. Oh, oh. soft yeah. there. Director Malik. Hello. Director Edwards over as an attendant. Hey, well, I will leave Hello. since he's here. I, I'll oh. move you to the attendee side. Yeah, move, move me to the attendee, bring him on. Hello. And somebody <laughs> answering. because. Hello, Safwat. Hello, Hello. Safwat. Um, Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, I'm sorry, I'm late. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you, Director Edwards, for stepping in uh, until now. So um, welcome. We, were, we, we are on um, item two, uh, discussing the two and three, the Sleepy Hollow expended, steelhead uh, expenditure, proposed expenditures um, to, to maintain access to the facility. Uh, road repair. That's what we were discussing. If I could jump in real quick to to spin you up, Sopwat. Um, Larry's covering these two items, but I'm also involved. Um, 
this item is for emergency work such as a rock fall or some kind of debris flow that would stop access to the road and director anderson brought up the question um you know calam has sometimes well in the past for the most part has always responded to these emergencies um but as we use the road more and more and more and calam uses the road less and less their response time can sometimes be too slow so um we are asking for also uh, permission to spend funds on an emergency basis to remove a rock fall to gain access to the facility as well. Um, and we're asking for that because we are nervous that Calam can't respond in a timely manner and might not recognize the urgency. So Director Anderson said, you know, maybe it would be uh, best if the district and Calam used the same contractor. Um, uh, we've reached out to many. We, we got a reply from one who said he could, you know, do this work within a response time of roughly three days if there was an emergency. We don't really know Calam's contractor response time. Um, he apparently comes from the Central Valley from information from Larry. So, um, my personal feeling to the answer to that question is if you have two contractors that could potentially respond you might have a better chance of getting the road open sooner in some kind of emergency for example let's say we get a large rain event in march or in february and the road is absolutely closed and we call calam and we say hey can your guy do it uh, they may say yes or no, and then if we really feel the need that we have to be on site, then we could call our contractor and then maybe figure out who can be there first. It's a, I kind of think of it as a kind of a backup system. Um, there's no guarantee we would spend this money in this fiscal year um, unless we had some kind of significant blockage. And then, uh, so I don't know if that helps with the perspective but you know right now we're in there you know we're releasing the fish right now um so we're there every single day from eight in the morning till you know clearing out at four to release fish um luckily we've had nice weather um we developed this staff note you know during the rains we have already had some rock falls calam has been out there once already um we're trying to be proactive so that uh if something happens, we've already talked to the board on this particular issue, and that's kind of where we're at now. And how much is this? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have my book with me to figure out the cost of what you're proposing. Yeah, this this is for asking for expenditure of $9,950 in an emergency if there was kind of a rock or debris slide blocking the road. Um, and how, how do you get this money from Calam? No, this would be out of the district's budget because there's a loosely written agreement from 1994 that talks about shared responsibility for the road. If I had to characterize the maintenance of that road over the last 20 years, Calam has done the majority of the expenditures. Um, they, they spent roughly a million to uh, prevent rocks from falling on vehicles while they drive by. I think you guys saw that on the field trip, the chain link fence. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to show that we are also here at this table to offer some help in some kind of significant road issue without, you know, destroying, you know, our budget for this kind of thing. And that's up to 99.50 uh, just in this fiscal year. Is that right? It's not That's 90, it's okay, thank you. I have, it, it adds, let me back up. I uh, have grave concerns about us bailing out Cal-Am time after time after time after time. And you said that this is loosely agreed arrangement i don't know what loosely agreed arrangement means 
Can you hear me? I don't have the specific language right in front of me, but there's a 1994 agreement where, which allows us to um, operate Sleepy Hollow on Calam's property. And in that agreement, it states something to the effect that the district and Calam will share maintenance of the access road. However, Calam is kind of in the driver's seat. So this, if, we go, if let's just lay it all out on the table. The next item is asking for money as well for maintenance. We approached Calam and said, hey, the road is starting to deteriorate. Can you fix it? They went to their contractor and got an estimate of what it would cost to fix it. And they said, hey, you know, can you guys chip in on this? You know, because, you know, we're going to the area less and less and you guys go there every single day. So, you know, it's, it's a complicated situation of, you know, how much road maintenance do you do? How much do you let it slide? And what we can't tell anybody precisely is at what point do you do, if you do too, if you don't do enough maintenance, does it, at what point does it get more expensive to fix it? And at what point yeah. do you, you know, just access- I'm seeing Maha and a friend here. Vehicles. So it's it's a tough thing to figure out of how much to maintenance to do yeah, versus that is, that is. let it slide. Well, I have a question about that. Why are we there? When when did we start the fish, the, the um, facility, Sleepy Hollow? When was it started? Well, the first year was 1997, oh, I believe. Software, there's the background. Excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, Amy. Software, there's some background noise coming. Software, can you mute you, your computer, please? No, here, put these in your. Thank you. I muted him. So. Uh, if, we, if that uh, facility was started, in order to address the damage to the river that had been caused by Calam, which was pointed out by the state, I believe, then aren't we doing this service for the fish, but to cover Calam's? Well, no, we we did it. Yeah, sort of. We we did a uh, we we began. Um, a program on the river prior to order 9510, late 80s. And we identified the need for, you know, habitat restoration and uh, fish care, if you will. Um, the facility didn't get built till the 90s, um, right about the time. Larry, do you remember what year it got built? Yes, it was um, 1996. Well, 96. it was it was actually built between 94 and 96. It was operational in 96. Right. And so we have been doing a mitigation program and order 9510 uh, through a footnote basically said the district has been doing mitigation programs that appear to be working and benefiting the watershed. And therefore, the district should continue to do so. But if they choose not to, then continuation of those programs or that program would become an obligation of Cal-Am. So it was a contingent liability, but we on our own as just a local regulatory agency identified the need for mitigation through uh, the allocation EIR for one, but even as I said, prior to that in the eighties, we recognized certain actions needed to be taken. So these were all things that the district wanted to take on. Um, Cal-Am knows that it's a contingent liability on on them but and actually um our supreme court settlement or uh, uh victory over the public utilities commission further identified that the district had been doing these activities um as have some other court cases that uh, deal with our our fees where the courts have said no no these are local agency programs that were done at the initiative of the district and therefore fall under the category of uh, locally, potentially locally funded and so forth. So we've been lucky to get Calam to agree to pay for things and do things. 
but um, you know, that facility, I just, the reason I left is to send myself a copy of the 94 agreements. So I can see the exact language, which I, which I did, but um, yeah, it's not so much as covering, it is covering for them because, uh, you know, obviously order 9510 identified that it, it is something that must continue and should the district not do it, um, it is CalAMS, but we didn't actually bail CAM out, CalAM out so much as we recognized that there was no level of water uh, extraction from the river that didn't have environmental impacts that need mitigation. And so we had like five options. The best option still required mitigation. And so that was our decision beginning, you know, I think the allocation EIR was roughly 1990. Um, so at that time is when we said, well, look, we've got to step up our mitigation beyond what we were already doing. So a little so, history. So is there, thank you for that, Dave, um, useful. Um, is there a basis to ask CalAM to reimburse the district for these expenses? I guess is what comes down to. If, yeah, well, and there's also two levels. Um, and I think we saw this in the most recent grading issue. CalAM typically comes out there with, um, you know, high suspension trucks. And we will often try to get out there with our trucks, but also some lower uh, wheelbase or lower uh, height vehicles. And so sometimes our needs exceed what Callan may say their needs are. Um, and then there's also timing. If we're in, you know, in fish rescues and we've got a timeline, you know, we're trying to, right now, we're trying to get ready for releases, but first we have to uh, pit tag them. And it's about, you can only do about 200 a day. And so we need like 10 days straight of tagging before we can release. So if we're in a time crunch, and a big boulder comes down, you know, Cal Ann may look at it and say, well, you know, we'll get to that in four or five days and we'll be like, you know, we need to do this tomorrow. Um, so we, you know, we often have different needs or timeframes. Yes, you know? I understand that. And so I understand the reasons why we need um, to be able to do things quickly sometimes. Um, I, I, the only thing I'm wondering to sort of get at um, Southwest's concern from a different angle is just since it's CalAM's contingent responsibility to, uh, to do this mitigation work, do, do we have a basis to say, well, we, we'll do it because we need to do it more quickly than you're able to do it uh, sometimes in order to do this properly, but CalAM should reimburse the district for it. Do we have a, a leg to stand on? Do we have a basis to make that request? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and the, too. Yeah, we don't have a cost sharing agreement on the mitigation program. Um, yeah, CalAM does not, CalAM has a contingency liability as long as the district's performing though. CalAM's contingent liability does not spring into being. So it would only be by contract if we could negotiate a reimbursement, we could. CalAM would want to make certain that they were would be able to pass this through the rates. But I think one of the ultimate questions is, uh, which is cheaper for the rate payer? Uh, is it, you know, if CalAM does it, they magically uh, add a lot of overhead and uh, uh, sometimes profit that the district doesn't do. So. Uh, the answer that just because we could pass something to CalAM doesn't always mean that that's the best deal for the rate pair. Thank you, Dave. That's helpful. Yeah, and here's the actual language from 94. Um, the, dis the use by district of any right-of-way roads or Ford located on the licensed property shall be at the risk of the district. So, you know, whatever the conditions are, it's, it's at our risk um, liability-wise. The company also assumes similar risk. And then it goes on to say, the district shall repair and maintain each such right-of-way roads or forward in its existing condition. And here's the, the catch-all, if required by the company. And so that's, that's the problem of in drafting, which is we may look at it and say, that needs to be fixed. 
but it's only if required by the company. It does say the company shall contribute pro rata for any damage caused by its use. But again, that's by its use. So a, a rock fall from the denuded steep slope on the east side of the road, probably, uh, you know, that's an act of God not caused by Cal Am's use. Mm -hmm. um, anything, you know, anything, building a new right of way road or Ford requires us to get written approval by the company, which would not be unreasonably withheld. So it's, you know, it wasn't crystal clear. Um, that's, that's it on road use. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say one thing about, uh, you know, Cal Am is with this next item, Cal Am is asking for a 50% contribution. Um, for past repairs, and we'll talk more about that, but it has a little bit of um, relationship to this item. So Calam recently completed a million dollars worth of slope stability repairs. Um, in my opinion, if we want to go down the road of uh, consistently asking Calam to participate in road repairs, like in a 50-50 fashion, there's the potential of a large repair uh, in the future. There's that that entire slope wasn't fixed. A portion of the slope was fixed that that was unstable. Um, and there are other parts of the road where uh, you could have landslides that nothing was done. In fact, uh, other parts of the road sit above the the burned portions of the slope um, from the Carmel fire. So, I mean, it's it's one thing to desire a 50-50 relationship, but then it's another when they come to you and say, well, we have another half million in repairs. Would you please um, participate by paying half? So that's the, the downside risk to asking Calam each time uh, to participate in paying for this type of uh, road maintenance. So I've heard two, the two from, from you, Larry, and from you, Dave Laredo, you know, two uh, very good reasons not to go down that path of uh, just we, especially since here the you know we're talking about relatively modest sums less than twenty thousand dollars combined for these two items before us today um and so i don't know to to based on what i've heard that um it, it may be best for the ratepayers and for the district's ability to do what what our people think needs to be done on the road when it needs to be done, that we should um, approve the staff recommendation and go with that for now. Yes, Director Anderson. I have more question. Um, can you tell me what the, um, the history of this agreement in terms of how much have, have we always paid about 50% or has it been different? I'm just curious of the past expenditure towards this work on the road? Um, the, the, the budget routinely had about $5,000 um, for road maintenance, and it really consisted of staff going to Murphy's Hardware and getting um, asphalt patch to, to patch roads or to you know get a few shovelfuls of road base to, to shovel into potholes. And so that was in the past. Um, up until the removal of the Sank Mini Dam project went through, that was the typical budgeted expense. So, I mean, what I what I meant to be asking is, what is our what has the percentage contribution of the company versus the district been over time for this work? Has it been fifty uh, fifty? I'm not sure we know because Calam routinely took care of any kind of major road clearing. The, the okay. things that the district did was hand clearing and filling in potholes by hand. Okay, thank you. Hey, Larry, back on something earlier where you mentioned the million dollar of slope stabilization. Can, can we agree that that's, that's actually a permanent capital asset so they would not want to be reimburse for any of that because they could rate base it and get paid as opposed to maintenance. I, I'm I'm not sure how they did that 
Uh, I yeah. know they told me they they started with four hundred thousand and they ended with a million, and that's the extent I know of how they you know how they viewed that. Yeah. Oh, they did say they did say that they were really troubled with having to go to, before the PUC and request an increase to a million dollars from the four hundred thousand that they had um, been authorized to spend. Oh, so they actually got authorization. I, I'm not sure that they have got authorization yet. Right for the full million, yeah. But that still would have been increased in the in the rates that they were uh, approved, if they get authorization. Yeah, or it's sitting in a memorandum account waiting for the next round. But yeah, they, they would very likely treat it as an asset, like a you know slope stabilization. Because, you know, there's like chain link fence or whatever you want to call it and stakes and so forth. So it's like a structure. Yeah. So they'd make the case that it can be depreciated and put into rate base. So. Oh, OK. Other questions <laughs> or comment or comments? I appreciate it. Uh, we still do not have any members of the public. We have no members of the public. Okay. Uh, I meant from uh, directors or staff oh, okay. on these issues or council. Okay, well. I recommend approval. Of item one, I mean, item the first item. Um, yeah, item two. On this item item. two. I second that one. Appreciate the nitty gritty. Okay, well, let's let's have a vote then. Unless there are Director Malik, do you have anything you'd like to say on this? Anything further? Oh, you, you're muted. <clears throat> if you do, unmute yourself there. I'm vote, I'm voting no. <clears throat> okay. On both one and two. Okay. All right. Well, let's take them separately. Um, I've, the motion I made is for for the first item. Um, so let's do the vote and then we'll vote on the second one. Any member Malik? No. Many member Anderson? Yes. Many member Paul? Yes. And a motion passes on a vote of uh, uh, two yeses and one no. Okay, now Larry, do you have more to tell us about item three? Yes, so th this is a little different from item two. This is backward looking. This is carrying out deferred maintenance. Uh, the roads deteriorated over the last few years. Um, staff approached Cal-Am uh, with various options of uh, doing this work. And um, what we got was an offer from Cal-Am saying, well, it's gonna cost $27,000 to do the repairs that uh, we had both identified. And uh, I, I do wanna stress that the repairs are just to repair the, the worst parts of the road. It's not really improvements. It's just making repairs to get the road back to where it was three years ago. Um, they requested a 50-50 split. Um, we said we could uh, contribute 99-50. And their response was, okay, well, we will either pay for the rest or depending on what their management determines, scale back the work um, so that uh, the district pays half and cal -Am pays half. So uh, there would be, if this goes forward, there would be some kind of letter commitment, I think, from the general manager to cal -Am prior to the work saying that the district would reimburse cal -Am for up to 99.50. So this is more along the lines, I think, of uh, perhaps where the discussion was going in the previous item with the district sharing in the costs uh, rather than the district paying um, a full cost. So uh, I, I think the work could go forward uh, as soon as possible uh, if it were approved depending on what cal -Am schedule is, um, certainly it has to be done in the dry. Um, so if it starts raining again, which 
I'm sure everybody would like to see, then the work would be postponed until um, the road's dry. Larry, um, clarify the coincidence or relationship between the amount in item two and the amount here. They're both 99.50. Was that for uh, it, it, expenditures on construction over ten thousand dollars require the district to go to bid? Ah, okay. So this is just mm. Macy's Macy's pricing. <laughs> Now, who, who would be the project manager for these repairs, the district or Calam? Calam would be the project manager. We did. I mean, we we agreed on the work that needed to be done. Um, so I, uh, unless it gets scaled back, um, you know, we have an agreement about what would be done, and then it would just be the Calam project manager making sure that happens. Well, you say that the twenty-seven thousand you agreed with Calam that the twenty-seven thousand dollars would cover just the the most urgently needed repairs. So, uh, the the idea of scaling that back sounds like a very bad idea. So, I'm wondering whether we can do something to um, to get some kind of commitment from them if we contribute up to ninety-nine fifty that they will not scale back that work that you agree needs to be done? Yep. Well, I would certainly <laughs> like to see that happen, um, but it's uh, it's a management decision on their part, whether they wanna um, continue forward with all the work or just do a 50-50 share. I mean, it's their management decision. Yes, yeah. Yeah, but they're entering into an agreement with us um, to pay for we part could, of it. We could certainly express a desire to see that all the work is done and, and request that, that all the work go forward. Well, what if um, we made our, our, uh, our cost sharing conditional on them doing the, the work agreed upon, all of it, and not scaling it back? Could we do that? I don't have an answer for you. I think I'd want to talk that over with um, management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I was Cal Am, I would seize on that to go, well, sorry, but then we'll just not do anything. I mean, if if, if I felt that way on that particular day, because that they've yeah. done things like that before. Uh -huh. How much help would it be? I mean, we're talking pretty small numbers for us here. I realize how much... Uh, help would it be for the ratepayers if we were, I guess it's not our road, huh? We couldn't be the project manager and they reimburse us and we're not charging all the um, extra numbers on the ratepayers, like the 10%, percent if, if the district were to do this project, it would need to go out to bid. And then, okay. the, then Cal-Am would no longer be the project manager. Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, this is definitely path of least resistance for us. Yeah. But you think this is a better way to go than to to basically do these repairs ourselves, be the project manager, put it out to bid, and so on. This is, um, the, the, you prefer this route, the one recommended here. Well, if you want my opinion, I can give it. Uh, my opinion is basically anything under fifty thousand uh, dollars is very costly to go to bid, and it's 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 more cost efficient not to have a bid. But the law says that anything over ten thousand has to go to bid. Um, there's it's there's an enormous amount of resources that are needed to go to bid. Um, staff yeah. resources. And I would just add to that, we're, the way we're staffed right now is we don't really have a, a ready, able, and willing body. Um, we'd have to extend Larry's contract probably to, to do it as um, because Maureen can't can't take it on given Pure Water Monterey, uh, the new deep wells, and the expansion. So um, I can't, I don't know how to raise my hand. So bear with me, please. Okay. Yep. 
May I say something? Yes, of course, go ahead. The district is not equipped to manage a project. There's not enough manpower and there's not enough expertise to act as a contractor or a supervisor of a contractor to do this work. It's gotta be Kalam and Kalam is playing the game with, with all of us and put us under the gun. And again, I'm in advance, I'm putting no to, pay, to spend this money. So I thought I'd let you know. Thank you, uh, Safwat. Um, well, I agree with the first part of what you said, which is what I was hearing from uh, Dave and Larry, which is that, that the district currently doesn't have the resources to take that on and, and manage it. So that this is, this is a way to get it done. So with that, I'm inclined to, to um, approve the staff recommendation. Um, Director Anderson, would you like to say, yes, please. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, now it's been thoroughly explained and kind of in a, in a box. So we need to get it done and the fish need it and the staff needs it, Sleepy Hollow needs it. Yeah. Seems like a... So yeah, that, that's, that's where I end up now that we understand better that the resource constraints that you're having to deal with. Um, so I move to, uh, to approve the staff recommendation. And I sure hope that they do $20,000, $27,000 worth of work. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it's a bare, it's a, it's not a bare minimum, if that. Um, do I have a second for the motion? I, I second. Thank you. Let's, uh, there are no. No members of the public. Look, so let's take it out to a vote, please. Committee member Malik? No. Committee member Anderson. Yes. Chair Paul. Yes. The motion passes on a vote of two yeses and one no. Thank you. And thanks for your patience in explaining yeah. all the complexities of this situation. It seems like a minor road repairs would be a simple item, but it's not with a relationship we complicated relationship we have with Kelly. All right, item four. Yeah, and before we get into item four, just um, one comment on the previous item. Um, Safwat's right that we don't have the, the resources, but we do have the capability. So in defense of our staff, I just want to uh, tell you that we've got, we have managed many construction projects. Um, we have been owner's project manager with hired construction managers underneath. And we've also just been a uh, construction manager uh, directly with the contractor. So we do have that capability. We just don't have enough of it. And uh, we just are not in a position to take on new projects at this point in time. Um, pretty soon we'll have buttoned up uh, the ASR construction. We still have some landscape and fencing and some uh, other minor issues. <clears throat> we may reopen that to do some interior work on the existing building, but um, Maureen's handling that. And then we're working as project manager on the uh, injection well facilities for pure water. So, and we, you know, we did the crib wall on uh, the Carmel River. Uh, we did Sleepy Hollow. Um, so we, you know, our guys, our guys, our, our men and women are very capable of managing projects. Uh, so anyway, moving on to item four. Thank you. I just want to say, that, no, thank you for saying that. And I, and I do, that's important to say and to know. And I, when I spoke of um, lack of resources, I understood it to be not enough of this expertise. We would need oh, more, yeah. more people. That's what, that's what I understood to be the resource constraint. Yeah, agreed. Um, so item four is a um, kind of a belt and suspenders approach. Uh, where we stand right now with financing for Pure Water Monterey expansion is as follows. Um, we've authorized pre-construction expenditures through uh, our approval of uh, Amendment 6 to the cost sharing agreement. So we will be doing 
permitting, legal, and uh, design work uh, up to the point of bidding the project. Um, we've pretty much agreed with Monterey One Water at this point that we will not go to bid until we've got approval of the water purchase agreement. At that time, we will need to be uh, very assured that we have financing in place to do the construction. We, uh, in conjunction with Monterey One Water, uh, worked on uh, applications to the federal government through the EPA's WIFIA program. WIFIA stands for uh, Water Infrastructure Financing Innovation Act. Um, they created a loan program under that act with federal dollars. And um, there's also an application pending to the state revolving fund, similar to how the first phase of pure water was financed. Both of those timetables are unknown. State Water Board uh, has indicated that it could take as much as a year uh, to get a funding agreement in place or longer. Um, the federal government, similarly, we don't know what their schedule is. Um, the WIFIA program has become more popular, so they've received a number of applications. We did both applications under the uh, assumption that the Pure Water Expansion will be uh, an amendment to the existing feasibility studies. Um, there's some pros and cons to that. If, if they had not raised the federal cap on an existing project's uh, grant from 20 million to 30 million, then we might have filed the expansion as a new project because it's got a lot of nice um, features to it under the criteria under which federal grants are awarded. But they went ahead and they extended the Title 16 uh, federal grant program uh, from 20 to 30 million. We've received 19 point, call it 6 million. So that additional 10 million um, we're doing as an extension of the already filed project rather than a new separate project. Similarly for the state revolving fund loan. Now, all that being said, um, the timeline might not work where the state or federal monies are ready to go. So if we were to do either A, an interim tax exempt financing, something called uh, uh, either uh, bond anticipation notes or you know, just, just call them notes, a two year note, uh, that would then be uh, taken out with the proceeds of a state revolving fund loan. That would be a tax exempt borrowing. Um, similarly, the uh, state revolving fund loan itself, because uh, a large portion of that is funded by a state tax exempt financing to match uh, federal EPA monies, um, it can be considered a tax exempt funding source. So under IRS tax code, if the intention is to reimburse yourself from a uh, future tax exempt financing, you need to have a reimbursement resolution in place that will then allow you to do uh, reimbursement of all the expenditures after that date and time. So this is just simply mm -hmm. being put into place, not knowing what our permanent financing will be, but it's um, making sure we're compliant with uh, federal IRS regulations in order to have a clear, clear runway to reimburse ourselves if necessary. Thank you. That is very clear to me. Any questions or comments from directors? Similar to me as well, though. I couldn't repeat it. <laughs> okay. Um, if there are no questions, um, I move to... Um, approve the recommendation. Second. So let's vote. Committee member Malik. Committee member Anderson. Yes. Committee member Malik. Yes. Chair Paul. Yes. The motion passes on a vote of three to zero. Thank you. So the annual update of the investment policy. 
item four. Yeah, well, let's, well, let's Suresh uh, do this one, but I, I can tell you the only change are the dates. Uh, yeah, and before that, Dave, uh, just a minor correction on the agenda itself, the title, it's missing an F where it says update O investment policy it should read off investment policy. Okay, so as, as far as I'm, this has been explained to, to the, the newer directors before, so I don't need for, um, for it to be explained again, but do directors have any questions for Suresh about this? I'd like to ask Suresh what he just said before that. What was the correction? Oh, on the agenda itself, uh, Director Anderson, if you read item number five on the agenda, it's just missing an F. Oh, 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 okay. On the first page. Correct. Yeah, whichever. Typo. Yeah, just, thank just you. Just a typo, yeah. Yeah, and just so you know, as, as uh, Karen said, that she's heard this all before, um, all, all we've done in the last five years is reflected in the, um, the attachment, which is a little chart. And if you go to the final column that says MPWMD allowed, um, you can see there's two no's in there or three no's. Um, yeah. Oh, I guess there's four actually. Um, those were things that we came to the board and said, even though they're allowed by the state of California, um, you as board members don't have enough expertise in these areas to know whether we as financial officer and general manager have enough expertise in these areas. And, and we agree that um, repurchase agreements are repos and then reverse repos and collateralized bank deposits and pass through mortgages, which are you know, collateralized mortgage obligations. These were the things that crashed and burned in 1998 that led to the, uh, the Great Recession, if yeah. you will, the closing of many banks. Mm -hmm. So we went ahead and took our local authority out of the equation for the investment policy. Those are the only changes that have been made in, probably in 10 years. Um, other than we removed an approval of the county treasurer from our policy because um, there was no reason to run it past the county treasurer anymore because our expertise was sufficient. And that was a kind of an antiquated uh, line that's probably been gone now for six or seven years. This is good to know. And I presume if you, if you wanted to, I mean, you would, if you thought other changes were warranted, you would recommend them. Yeah, in yeah. And if, I wanna get out of here, so I'm not gonna belabor it with, with uh, much more discussion, but if, if you knew how the rating agencies actually rated all these collateralized debt obligations, and then what actually happened, which you probably could learn through a couple of movies or Michael Lewis book or something, um, the fact of the matter is that what they thought had absolutely no risk had a lot of risk. But if they could figure out a way to eliminate the risk in um, collateralized debt obligations, I think we'd probably take them on again, try to put them back in the, the policy. But um, as of right now, there, there's, they really haven't changed much. And uh, so it's kind of a buyer beware problem. So we really don't need that. You know, Suresh's program is all very conservative. It's um, local area investment fund, LAFE, and uh, laddered negotiable certificates of deposit. And that's kind of it. I think from time to time, we may want to start looking at um, treasury securities and strips. Um, but the collateralized CDs have been better for the same uh, maturity. So I think we've got the things that work best for the district. Yeah, and it's also dictated on the size of the portfolio as well. The amount of money that we have in the portfolio it just doesn't warrant um, looking into anything else but the uh, but the CDs, the Levitt CDs, and the Elaif. Thank you. Yeah, I'd really love to do some supranational, natural, supranational obligations. You know, like some 
sovereign fund of some kind, just for the heck of it. <laughs> okay, questions? I have none. Okay. So I, I move that we recommend to the board approving this annual update of the investment policy. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. I don't think there's any further comment. Um, so let's go ahead and vote. Committee member Malik? Yes. Committee member Anderson? Yes. Chair Paul? Yes. The motion passes on a vote of three to zero. Thank you. All right, next item, treasurer's report. Yeah, so this is the November treasurer's report. Um, the actual exhibit is attached on page 6A. Uh, yes. Exhibit 6A on page 31. And as you'll see, beginning balance, we started off with a little over $16 million. We finished a uh, little over $17 million. Uh, and this is for November. So again, we have not received any of our installment for the uh, property tax or the water supply charge that came in in December. Uh, and so December, you'll see the balance go up uh, significantly about three or $4 million uh, due to those receipts. Uh, exhibit 6B, C and B are basically just the backups, uh, regular checks, payroll checks, um, and then the unaudited financial statement. So if there's any question, I can answer that. Any questions, uh, directors? I have none. And I know Dave. I have none. Okay. So I move that we approve um, the report that we recommend to the board that it approve the report. Second. Second. Thank you. And so let's vote on that. Committee member Malik. Yes. Committee member Anderson. Yes. Chair Paul. Yes. The motion passes on a vote of three to zero. Ooh. Measure J, item eight. Yeah, so item seven and eight are just informational unless you have specific questions. Okay. okay. Um, so let's move to item nine. The uh, special board meeting for Friday, there's only two items. One is the renewal of the uh, AB 361 teleconference uh, language. And then the real single item is uh, strategic goals and objectives for the calendar year. Um, the chair has seen the proposed staff note and the attachments. Um, the attachments will include uh, three pages from Dr. Garcia's uh, workshop a year ago on kind of the hierarchy of mission, vision, values, goals, objectives, et cetera, just to remind us what a goal and an objective is and the differences. Um, then there will be a, an update and discussion on uh, last year's goals and progress to date. And then uh, there's suggested goals and objectives based on what was not accomplished last year or what may have been accomplished last year, but should find its way back onto the uh, agenda for this year, certain things related to financial reporting and transparency and so forth. Um, and then there's instruction to the board in that packet that you'll receive. I don't know, Joel, when, when will they receive that? Tomorrow morning or end of the day today, whenever. Um, that just requests the directors be prepared to come in with one to three new goals um, for the calendar year and one to three objectives uh, in support of those goals, as well as having scrutinized the uh, attachment that had suggested goals and to drop off anything um, that you think needs to be taken off. So, so that one's all set to go out. Um, as I said, hopefully you'll have a you know, full day in advance with that packet. And Joel, I, were you about to tell us when that's going out? Um, I, did, I have to check in with Sarah. Um, okay. If it comes out um, before five, or it comes out, if not, um, for sure you'll have 
uh, your meeting materials for the special meeting on January 21 and the 27th um, tomorrow morning. So. Okay. Yeah, because I did send um, the staff note pretty early this morning to you and Sarah. So that's correct. Uh, turning our attention to January 27th, uh, regular board meeting agenda. There's only a couple things I want to highlight there. Um, we've talked at length about most of the consent calendar items. The um, there will be a, a report item 10 on fish rescues. Uh, because it's timely, we're doing releases right now. This is just more an opportunity for our public to understand certain things we do and when we do them. Dave, uh, did you see my email? I got an email from Thomas Christensen, and he doesn't think that he'll have his um, the fish rescues report ready for the 27th, and um, he's asked me to push it out to uh, February. Yeah, I saw that, but you know, I'm not so sure. Well, I guess if we're trying to, you know, I think he's trying to dovetail it with the um, annual mitigation report. So it's really final rather than me just asking Corey. Right. Um, yeah, I'm willing to, yeah, I'm willing to put that out to February then. Okay. And, and Dave is also, I, we have a placeholder for 5 p.m. Uh, closed session. I'm not sure that we need that. Okay. Yeah, I don't think there's any litigation. Um, the, 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 nothing's uh, ripe enough for the board to discuss it or provide direction. Yeah, I saw something, uh, Joel, you had sent yeah. an email. Yeah, I did send out an email on Saturday. Um, I'm not sure if we want to have a closed session meeting uh, to discuss the GM's amendment. Oh, uh, that's what it was. Yeah. Contract <laughs> for COLA. <laughs> so, so um, I think they. Dave Laredo and I should talk about that offline. Isn't that the best? Yeah. Way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. We can just stay on the line here when everybody okay. else drops off. Okay. So rather than renumber everything on the agenda, so let's move the fish rescues to February, but then let's bring back an update on uh, the Measure J process so that I can. Uh, inform the public about the January, you know, obviously they read the papers and the weekly and so forth. So they probably heard, but I can at least update on what happened January 5th, where we're going. Um, I don't want to discuss every place we're going. Uh, Dave Laredo and I talked about this briefly uh, earlier today. We've got some special legislation drafted. Uh, Dave Loretta did a, a yeoman's job at, at drafting some legislation. And, and you are being recorded, Dave. So Okay, um, good point. So anyway, there are things related to future actions that um, we may or may not um, be ready to discuss, but current actions related to uh, the uh, Measure J, you know, I think we at least owe the public kind of an update. So um, we'll leave it at that. So let's make that number 10. Well, that will be just an update on the LAFCO proceedings on uh, LAF January 5th. Mm -hmm. uh, LAFCO, no, an update on uh, Measure J slash acquisition of Monterey water system. Monterey water system. Oh, yeah. Even though it's mostly about LAFCO, just, you know, in general. Um, and then I wanted to highlight that we kept um, an item, the, the reimbursement resolution, we made an action item rather than consent, uh, just as an opportunity to um, let the public know that we're kind of thinking about financing, that it's a real project and we're moving along. And then um, we've got the uh, confirm and appoint commissioners. And so the way uh, Joel structured it right now is each uh, dis uh, division appointee is ready to go, but the at large, you'll have some choices. So we're not uh, representing a preference, but there are, I guess it's just three now, right? We got rid of um, Bob Zickfried. Yeah, that's the only one that we got rid of. Uh, yeah. So we, uh, 
So it leaves us with five. That leaves us with five? Yeah. Correct. So um, you'll get to, you know, at least have some discussion about those. I would imagine you'll want the League of Women Voters person as kind of a general overall uh, at-large appointee. Um, the others, you know, maybe based on what you know about the person and uh, what Joelle presents in the, the presentation, but there'll be some discussion there. And then item 14, the annual report, uh, I can tell you that there was a lot of editing going back and forth. Um, so we did get uh, comments by Melody Chrislock, Susan Schiavone, uh, Marley Martin, and uh, John Tilly. And there was uh, uh, quite an effort to represent the majority opinion, uh, which was followed with comments reflecting the minority opinion. Uh, but I think it'll be interesting reading. You can uh, probably imagine where it's headed. I don't think any of the um, majority really want to act very quickly on sunsetting because they realize we still have projects and we're still subsidizing those projects with other revenue sources beyond the water supply charge. So I think um, an understanding of reality has set, settled in to this group Whereas before we had a number of people who said, hey, you know, it's time to sunset this thing. The time is up. <laughs> it's like, well, we're, we're doing things with it. We need to. So um, that'll be interesting. There may be some discussion. You may get a, a committee or a panel member wanting to state their piece. Um, so be ready for that. And then the um, discussion item, um, this stems from a chair vice chair discussion uh, where uh, Karen's absolutely spot on that maybe we overschedule meetings because we've canceled quite a few um, and, and maybe we have too many committees. Um, I think that maybe we don't have too many committees but maybe we try to shoehorn in meetings when we don't need to. So that's just personal opinion, but that'll be the discussion, which is, um, you know, do we want to change the formal meeting schedule uh, or not? And do we want to drop any committees or not? And I'll be able to give a little bit of history on, you know, what happened to the rules and regs committee uh, as an example of, I don't think we actually eliminate committees. We just let them go dormant. Um, so, yeah, but it should be some interesting discussion on how we conduct our business. Okay, and let's, when you have a chance, you and I talk about, I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether any of these committees are unnecessary or whether we should have them meet, meet certain committees meet less frequently yeah. you know, before the board meeting. Um, on, on 13, um, I, I'm, I want, to be sure that the board members are gonna receive the information um, that's available about the commissioners that have been, the people who have been selected and then the candidates that remain so that they can think about it before, before the meeting. Yes, um, so what I've drafted up uh, for the 27th um, is a, um, an exhibit that reflects all of the director's appointees uh, the supervisor's appointee and Mayor Roberson's appointee to the redistricting advisory committee. Uh, we have five um, at-large candidates um, and they are as follows um, as Connie Murray, Mark Posen, on, and Monica Lau, Mark Eisenhart, and Wayne Downey. Um, on the other attachment that I'll present to the board, um, is a list of letters received. And then uh, followed by that list, um, you'll actually see the letters received by um, each of the uh, candidates or applicants. Perfect, thank you. Joel. Hey, and, and while we have Safwa, um, Joel, what, what was the resolution on uh, Safwa's division appointee? So uh, division three, that would be, uh, he appointed Nancy Selfridge. Oh, okay. Great, because um, uh, Wayne is uh, Libby Downey's husband and he lives in the, the uh, Safwetz division as well. So 
it's, I mean, Nancy will be great. So I don't have anything more to say, but had he not come up with Nancy, then Wayne would have been a good one. So. Yeah, well, so that's, you know, I'm sure the directors are all want to look at the geography. So, yeah. Yep. For, for example, if, if, if Nancy Selfridge's, Selfridge's Division Three might be inclined to pick one of the candidates from one of the other divisions for the remaining at large, I don't know. But, but I, and you've given me all the information I needed uh, so far, but I just wanted to be sure all the directors will get it. So that's, thank you, Joelle. Any questions on this? Not from me. Okay. Hey, speaking of redistricting, um, unrelated, but just a heads up, if you're interested in knowing the new Senate assembly or congressional districts, um, there is a website with maps. Ah. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we should all just kind of have this in our pocket because our, you know, our, so Mark Stone's been uh, redistricted out of existence, poor guy. Um, but anyway, if you go to the website, it's called we draw the lines ca.org. So one, one word, we draw the lines ca.org. And then at the top, uh, there'll be a, uh, a menu for final maps. And then you've got, um, you know, you got PDF versions, you got uh, GIS uh, data layer versions and so forth. So, um, but yeah, but you and your con constituents may be wondering who's representing who and where the lines are drawn and so forth. So it's an easy place to go. Yeah, thank you. I, I have, you know, looked at, at the, a bunch of times at where the new boundaries are, but I haven't actually found a map that when you print it out has enough detail that it's actually useful to me. Um, so I'm not sure if I've been to this site or not. I can't remember. Yeah, and I'm not sure that's gonna do it for you either, but... Um, if I find a, a, a source of a, a better map that has more detail so we can really see, you know, the what's in each district, um, I'll let you know. And if you find it first, please let me know. Yeah, well, it's gonna be interesting because like the new assembly district, it's, um, you know, frustrating, I think, for anybody who wants to be an assembly member, because now you've got, you know, it, it picks up downtown San, uh, San, Santa Cruz and then nothing else in Santa Cruz County then it picks up Monterey, it picks up San Luis Obispo, and, and also you know, picks up Big Sur along the way. And so you've got these culturally different places with population, you know, uh, San Luis, Monterey, and Santa Cruz. And it's very lengthy. I mean, it's gonna be a lot of windshield yeah. hit bugs, you know? And, and so it's, I, and John Wizard just announced his, candidacy for assembly, you know, and he's, he's local, but you're, there's going to be a guy coming out of San, uh, San Luis Obispo, Paso Robles, I think, or somewhere. So it's, just, it's going to be a different setup. And you, you probably already read about, you know, the Salinas Valley and their concerns about part of it being tagged with Santa Clara yeah. and the rest of it, you know, being, so it's, this is going to be, it's gonna make it tougher, I think, for us. We used to, years ago, about a decade ago, we had in our Senate district, um, Sam, whose name escapes me, uh, was a Republican out of San Luis Obispo County. And then he got districted out, which created the, the Senate district that Bill Monning won, and then subsequently John Laird won. So this stuff happens to our benefit and then sometimes to uh, our detriment. But um, anyway. Well, it's interesting and I guess arguably related to our last agenda item. I'm gonna adjourn this meeting. And, then, and, uh, and Karen, do you wanna, uh, you wanna just talk by phone rather than stay online or what would you whatever like? Whatever you prefer. Uh, what I can do is um, echo lock this meeting so that we know um, other, Okay, what, 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 we'll, we'll just stay on the line then. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Your co host. Okay, so I guess. I decided that you're a co host of this meeting. Okay. Okay, well, Safa, we showed the meeting. Oh, gone. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm just sort of going to need you to sort of hold my hand, walk me through how I've never yeah. done this before. Yeah. Or anything. So, uh, so, so the topic is going to be Dave Stoltz compensation and how, how, to, how to adjust that. Okay. Um, certainly, the, the, the theory is, is that the board will be appointing you or you and the vice chair or you and whomever to be the negotiators and provide direction to you as to what should be negotiated. And that gives you the opportunity to sit down with Dave and, and hash out specifically. Otherwise, you can't do this in closed session. So, so this gives you the opportunity to have the board discuss in closed session uh, issues about salary and benefits. Uh, my only question to you is, how long do you think that discussion will be? Uh, um, your, your choices, if we're gonna have it on this agenda, is put it on at five o'clock, and then if it's a half hour or 20 minute discussion, then you're all just stuck around for twiddling your thumbs until the, the meeting begins. The other option would be to have the closed session immediately trail the regular meeting, and that way you're not wasting your time. The, the expense of that, of course, is that uh, uh, you, 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 you're discussing it later. I'm sorry. Joe Pablo just called and said that you need to turn off the recording. Okay. Uh, supposedly it's recording. Okay. Th okay. Th I'm sorry. Th